Thank you, Ben. Um, thank you so much. I'm really excited to, to be here at Open Science and hopefully I will not put you guys to bed and I really appreciate uh, anyone staying up um, to sort of hear some of the work we are doing in, in my lab. Um, so I'm going to, basically I'm going to tell you about this parasite uh, that is called Toxoplasma, some general biology about it and then uh, tell you some of the approaches that we're using to trying to find new, um, new virulence factors, so new um, molecules, new genes that are involved in the parasite ability to cause disease. And so uh, on this immunofluorescence image, what you're looking at are the parasite in two different forms. Uh, it has multiple forms, and I will clarify that uh, later on, but you have the red form here and the green form, and this is uh, in blue here, you're looking at the host cell nucleus. So this is a monolayer of cells, human cells infected with the parasite. okay? So um, this is, we're gonna dissect this a little bit. So, you know, uh, I like how, um, uh, my, my host uh, just said that he heard about Toxo, but he doesn't really know much about it. And so I call Toxoplasma the Kardashian of the, of the parasite, but also the king of parasites, because, you know, it makes the news, you know, the New York Times, um, CBS, you know, there's even some, um, some startup around here. We're trying to get people to, um, to infect themselves with Toxoplasma so they will be a bit more um, more courageous to start to start new companies. So um, this this parasite is definitely in popular consciousness, right? Uh, people always say, "Oh, the crazy cat lady," and so on. And this is really mainly because of this parasite. And we'll, we'll talk about it. Why the kitten, which is so cute, is at the center of this of this story. So Toxoplasma gondii. I say Toxoplasma gondii. Um, this is the parasite in all of its glory. I mean, it's beautiful. Uh, it is an uh, uh, it is a, a cell, one cell, a single celled organism. And where did it get its name? So you're not seeing it here, but in uh, other uh, electron micrograph that I will show you, we see that. The parasite is really like a banana shaped um, parasite, so like a crescent, a moon crescent or banana shaped. And so it's shaped like a bow, essentially. So that from the Greek toxon, which means bow, and then form, so form like a bow where you get the plasma. Okay. So toxoplasma, a single celled organism that is a eukaryote, meaning that it has a nucleus and it is an obligate intracellular organism, meaning that it has to get inside the whole cell to be able to replicate and, 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 and survive. And so here you're looking at the parasite inside the cell in a structure that we call the parasitophorous vacuole. Okay. And yes, it looked white here, but it's full of um, networks and full of proteins. And so where does the, the, the Gundi name come from? It essentially comes from the first animal from which the parasite was isolated. And it was uh, this rodent called the Gundi, which was in Northern, uh, it's in Northern Africa. And so that's the name of this parasite. And why do we care about Toxoplasma gondii? We care about it because as much as we know about it, at, um, it, um, it's really widespread, but um, in most healthy individuals, it doesn't really cause severe diseases, right? Because your immune response is, is strong and can keep the parasite at bay. However, if you are immunocompromised, so let's say you have HIV AIDS or you are undergoing immunosuppression for cancer treatment or for transplantation, then all of a sudden the parasite will have severe um, sequelae, okay? So for instance, uh, over here, you're looking at chorioretinitis, which is infection of the eye. And this condition is essentially ocular toxoplasmosis, and it's really common in populations in South America. 
And uh, this is the brain of um, HIV patients that is that was chronically infected with toxoplasma and the parasite uh, reactivating. So you're having tissue cysts in, in the brain over here. And the parasite can also cross the placenta. And this is why pregnant women are, are asked not to empty the cat litter. And we'll get to that cat in a, in a minute. But uh, when the parasite crosses the placenta, it can infect the, the fetus and cause abortion, can also cause prem uh, premature birth and developmental delay. So here you're seeing a kid with encephalitis and um, some of the kids will die, but others will, it will really affect their development. And there are now some strong correlation with chronic toxoplasma infection with the onset of schizophrenia and other uh, mental illnesses, but the, I personally find the correlation with schizophrenia to be the, the strongest. So yes, we are healthy. We shouldn't maybe care about toxoplasma, but should we not? Well, it is believed that this parasite has infected 30% of the world human population, okay? So if there are, I don't know, 100% of us, uh, 100 people watching this, 30 people have toxo in their brain and they just don't know it, right? Most of, most of them don't know it. And I know it's not me because I get tested um, in, my, in my lab before uh, being able to do the work. So I know I, I am toxo negative. So in those 30, it could be somebody else. Um, but again, because you are healthy, um, you don't have to worry about it until you become immunosuppressed and so on. But in the United States, toxoplasma is the second leading cause of foodborne illnesses. So I know you have heard of um, salmonella outbreak, E. coli outbreak. Well, toxoplasma is the second leading cause of foodborne illnesses. So it's a big problem in, um, in uh, agriculture as well as farming and so on. And so... This is our uh, country, and you can see that I live in California here, and in, uh, the prevalence, according to the CDC, in the U.S. is between uh, 10 and 11 percent, but that really varies according to, um, to local, to particular regions. In the world, in some region, you can have 85 percent toxoplasmosis positivity, so it it's really is... It is a parasite to stay that, that, that is with us. Now, in addition to infecting human, toxoplasma is really unusual because it can infect virtually all warm-blooded animal. I'm talking anything from my dog, Ziggy over here, cats to sea otter. At some point in, on the California coast, there were, um, uh, <laughs> there were uh, 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 massive death of sea otters and that was caused by infection with toxoplasma. Um, so this, this parasite is really, it knows its thing, right? It can infect lamb, pig, chicken, human, you name it. And so why do we care? Here's the thing. There's no treatment for it. There's no vaccine for it. And when you get it, it's for life, okay? So let's go through it. So how do you get infected with toxoplasma? There are three main ways and three main forms. And I try to color code them, to color code the stages to help you with the rest of the talk. So here comes the cat, okay? And I will talk a bit more about that, but... When the cat is infected, it will shed in the environment this structure called oocyst. And inside the oocyst, you have this form called sporozoites. Okay. So if you eat the oocyst with sporozoites from contaminated water or contaminated uh, vegetables, so vegetables that have cat poo on them, you didn't wash them really well, you can get infected with toxoplasma. You can also become infected with toxoplasma if you eat meat from animals that are chronically infected with toxoplasma. So for instance, you eat your meat, you go, you know, you go to get a burger, they ask you, how do you want it? And you say, I want it rare, medium rare, or your steak, you want it rare and you think you're fancy. Well, yes, you can be fancy, but you're running the risk of having um, some toxoplasma 
uh, tissue cyst with bradyzoite in there saying hello to your gastrointestinal tract as well. So the third way you can get infected is if you are a pregnant woman and during your, preg your pregnancy, you eat some, um, some um, tissue cyst or some undercooked meat or you ingest uh, cat poop, let's say, with the O cyst in, then the parasite can become pachyzoid and will cross the placenta to infect the fetus, okay? So those are the three ways you can get infected with the parasite. Drinking contaminated water or vegetable, eating meat from chronically infected animals, so undercooked meat, or getting infected during pregnancy and having the parasite cross the placenta. All right, so let's look at it in a bit more, um, the, the entire cycle from the first host to, to the end. So we call the cats or the feline family. So you're talking lion, tigers. We call them definitive hosts because it is in this host that the parasite undergoes its sexual, its sexual reproduction. So sex is, is important to maintain, um, to maintain genetic diversity in, in the population of this, of this parasite. And so when the cat is infected, it doesn't really get sick. All it does, it's just shed. So it will excrete a lot of, of oses, okay? So there will be unsporulated millions of them a day for a certain period of time. And then after that, they are okay, all right? And so when the cat shed, the parasite, this is this form over here, this unsporulated form, okay? And in the environment, there are stimulus that we don't know the, par the parasite undergo what we call sporogony and start producing the sporozoite. And so you have, this is the cyst wall, the, the O cyst wall, and then inside you have two sporocysts, and inside each of these sporocysts, you have four sporozoites. So, so for every one O cyst, you have eight sporozoites, and each of them as infectious as the other. And the cat shed millions of them, okay, a day during the pre period. And so what happens is that, actually, I want to stop here. So you see how this is blue, right? Well, it, it's basically, um, we, we visualize this using UV, UV light. So you shine UV, UV light on the, on the cat poop, and then you see the, the oasis because they bring their own UV, their own sunscreen, if you will, because this oasis can survive in the environment for years. Right? They are protected from the, from the UV rays and so on. So they have their own uh, sunscreen. Anyway, so now you have this oasis in the environment, which is a big public health problem. But then let's say you have a rodent, like a rat, coming and drinking water you know, or grazing contaminated um, water contaminated with those oasis. The, inside the animal, the parasite will undergo its asexual cycle. So in that case, there's no sex in these hosts and they are called intermediate hosts. So the parasite will divide and then cause the animal to have, um, to be sick. So that's an acute phase of infection. And eventually it will stay in the brain and in the muscle, in the skeletal muscle of this animal. And then um, this is the tissue cyst. So this is what will be in the brain of the animal or in the heart of the animal or in the muscle of uh, the, 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 the muscle of the, of the animal. And eventually the predation, the parasite gets back in its definitive host. Okay. So where do we fit in all this? Well, we can get infected, like I said, by drinking contaminated water, right? Or, or contaminated vegetables or not washing your hand after you empty a pack liter. But we can also get infected by eating meat from organisms that are chronically infected with toxoplasma. So I am really insisting on this life cycle because it is really critical to understand the different um, developmental form of these parasites that are capable of causing infection. Okay. So now what happens after you've eaten your, um, you've eaten your, your steak rare, right? Or you've drunk the water. So I'm going to use the steak. So you have this, let's say you have pork chop or beef steak or something that is contaminated. So you will ingest it and the, the, the tissue cyst, right? With the green parasite, which we call bradyzoite, 
they will be released into the gastrointestinal tract where they will go and they will invade cell of your intestines. And they will invade and live inside this parasitophorous vacuole. And in there, they are um, 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 stimuli that we don't understand, that we don't know, they will differentiate into a different form. This form is called the tachyzoite, okay? So bradycardia, you can think about bradyzoite, bradycardia, so it's really slow. So the bradyzoite divide very slowly. The tachyzoite, on the other hand, like tachycardia, they, they divide really, really fast, okay? So they will divide inside the cell, they divide, they divide, and eventually they lyse the cell, killing the cell, and then they go on and disseminate throughout the body and infect neighboring cell and so on. Now, here's a little uh, fun fact. Toxoplasma can infect virtually all nucleated cells, all of them. Okay, so it cannot infect mature red blood cells in human because uh, our um, um, uh, mammalian uh, mature red blood cells don't have a nucleus and we don't understand why, but it's, it can infect virtually all um, all uh, nucleated cell. But thank God we do have an immune response. And so when the, um, when the, the parasite is basically taking over, the immune system um, acts and that sense, right? That sensing causes the parasite to switch back to the bradyzoite form. So then the, the, the tachyzoite switches back to the bradyzoite and then they will insist inside that tissue, that tissue cyst. And the tissue cyst is um, very impermeable to drugs that we know of, okay? So there's no treatment for that. And that is what stays in your brain for the rest of your life. And when you become immunosuppressed, the bradyzoite will reactivate and then the, and switch to tachyzoite and which will take over. And because you don't have an immune response, then it's become very serious. And this is why we really have to take pay attention to this parasite, essentially. Okay, so what do we care about in my lab? Well, I don't know if I, <laughs> maybe I, didn't, I haven't made it clear yet, but Toxo is important. It is very prevalent, but we really don't know much about the very first stage of the infection, of the infection because we don't know much about the biology of the bradyzoite and the sporozoite, so the form that comes out of the cat. We also don't really know the factors that uh, causes the bradyzoite to switch back to the tachyzoite. We don't understand how they get out, what they use to get in, how do they avoid the immune response. We don't know if they use the immune response as a trigger to say, hey, it's time to switch. So there are, there are a lot of questions that we don't know. A lot of what we know about the toxoplasma host pathogen interaction comes from studying tachyzoite because they are faster, you can get a lot of them, it's easier to manipulate, well, easier, definitely not E. coli, but much easier to manipulate. Um, okay, so that, so that that's really is our focus. We have a lot of questions, but before we can get to this side, we have a lot more work to do. Okay. So specifically, we are interested in how the, the, the processes that are associated with bradyzoite, which basically involve developmental differentiation, initiation of infection, and reactivation of a chronic infection. And we have a couple of questions that we, we are specifically interested in. Um, number one, how does toxoplasma regulate gene expression during differentiation? So how, what are the mechanism that tells a parasite that the parasite uses to go from bradyzoite to tachyzoite, right? Also, how does it adjust its metabolism during this process? I told you that tachyzoite divides very fast and bradyzoite divides very slowly, right? So there is a metabolic adjustment that needs to happen. So how does the parasite do that? We don't know. And then... Um, I need to fix my graph here. This is supposed to be green. But anyway, how does the bradyzoite or the sporozoite, how do they actually interact with the host cell? Like what are the molecules that they put inside the host cell to modulate host processes and to basically take over the host? And 
uh, by the end of the talk, hopefully I'll give you an idea of what we know about toxoplasma in, in, in this host pathogen interaction. Okay, so I have a picture of my students here. Um, the lab is divided in teams. So we're gonna tackle the first, um, the first and newest, uh, newest work in the lab, which is how does toxoplasma regulate gene expression? And we focus specifically on, um, on um, alternative splicing. And so this is team, team splicing. Avraj uh, just graduated uh, last fall, but Cynthia is, uh, she's a master's student driving the project. And then my lovely two high schoolers here, they just keep splicing genes all around. Um, so this is the cycle the, uh, the, the life cycle of toxoplasma that I was just describing. So you have a sexual cycle in the intermediate host, the sexual cycle in the definitive host, and you have the environmental um, sporogony, right? So you can already see that I only talked about three stages, but there are so many more stages that we don't really know anything about, okay? And so by studying um, tachyzoite to bradyzoite conversion, we learned that there are multiple uh, mechanism of uh, regulatory mechanism that the parasite uses to, 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 to ensure that this transition happens correctly. So there's transcriptional regulation that involves transcription factors like um, this AP, AP complex and AP2 family of, of transcription factors. You have this BFD1, which was just uh, identified as a master regulator. Then you have MARC which is also a new transcription factor associated with uh, epigenetic modification. The parasite can also use uh, pseudouridylation. This is when you add a pseudouridine, so a modified um, uridine. You add that to, um, to RNA uh, residues and that will alter whether or not, that will determine whether or not this RNA get degraded, they get um, stored or get uh, trans 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 translated. And then, of course, you have um, transla uh, translational regulation by phosphorylation of transcription factors, small regulatory RNAs, selective translation, and constitutive gene. And so, for, of all of these mechanisms, we wanted to focus on alternative splicing. So we know that alternative splicing has been involved, has been implicated in toxoplasma differentiation. But really, what we are interested in is how alternative splicing itself is regulated during uh, differentiation. Okay, so what is alternative splicing? So we've, I think um, most of us, at least in, in, in high school, right, at least high school biology, we learned about the central dogma, right? Like DNA goes to RNA, RNA goes to protein. So, you know, it was one protein, I mean, one gene, one protein, but that's not quite the case. So constitutive splicing and eukaryote, you have your pre-mRNA, then with um, regular splicing, you remove the intron, and then you have your exon, your mRNA, you make your protein. With alternative splicing, it's essentially, um, you cut, the, uh, you cut the, the, the pre-mRNA different ways to get you different, um, different type of, of, of protein. So one gene now doesn't only give you one protein, one gene can give you multiple proteins depending on how the pre-mRNA has been, has been spliced. So mm -hmm. there are proteins that are called serine arginine rich proteins that are known to regulate alternative splicing. Okay. So this is, um, this, this, these are two cartoons. So these SR proteins, they are involved in activating the machinery to do the splicing but they're also involved in suppressing the machinery that does the splicing, okay? So depending on the gene of, of, uh, of interest. All right, so during activation, the SR protein will bind to a region in the exon that are called exonic splicing enhancer or ESCs. And when it binds to this region, it will recruit elements of the splaciosome to the region of interest to get splicing to happen, right? And so that process here increased exon inclusion. So you get more exon into the final uh, mRNA. With repression, what happens is the SR protein will bind to an entronic sequence and prevent the recruitment of elements of the splaciosome. And that will cause 
the uh, splicing to be inhibited and essentially that will be repression of alternative splicing. These proteins are highly conserved in uh, eukarya. And here I am showing you um, the phylogenetic tree of uh, these uh, genes in human and other cousins of toxoplasma. So Babesia, Plasmodium, Crypto, Tyleria. And we'll talk about some of this later on. But you know, um, human have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So there are 12 in human and toxoplasma has four that are for sure based on annotation and then two that are predicted. So there's about six predicted uh, SR genes in toxoplasma. Okay, so what we, I, I don't know, <laughs> again, this is what I dream, sleep, and think about. It's differentiation, the differentially expressed genes. So we, we use the, um, we have a toxo, uh, genomic resource database. It's so useful. We have a lot of uh, transcriptomic data and information about um, toxoplasma genomes, different strains, and so on. And there are data that are published, and some of them are just big screens. So we look at the transcriptomic profile of these genes, of the SR genes, in the three infectious forms of toxoplasma. And uh, without going into too much detail, I think you can appreciate that they show um, um, developmental regulation themselves. So they're not expressed the same in different in the different um, stages of the parasite. Also, um, this SR three this SR three is essential and is the only one that has been studied in in, in toxoplasma. So what my student, um, Cynthia, and her team did, they um, wanted to knock out all of all these genes, right? So specifically SR1, SR2, and SR4, because we know that SR3 is essential and we're not pursuing that at the moment. So what we do, we use the CRISPR system whereby we um, have guide RNA specific to the gene of interest or so to the SR of interest. And then we replace, um, we replace the locus with an m cherry expressing cassette. And then we, um, we do by um, serial um, dilution, limited serial dilution, we isolate individual clone. We check that we have our uh, mutant by PCR and um, DNA sequencing. And then we do the study. So this is just showing you one example, and I think this one is the SR4 mutant um, that, we've, that we've gotten. And I can say I'm really, really proud of, of, of my graduate student for this because it's, she, she spent a lot of time optimizing this, this process and she's tried, we put type one parasite here, but we've tried in type two, which is really what we wanted, but so far we haven't been lucky. So it could be technical or it could be because the genes are essential in those, but I cannot. Spe I can only speculate now. But we, we we're working on that, so stay tuned to see where this goes. Anyway, so we only did, we just started this study. We started this study in in the fall, and so it's this data is really exciting. That's why I'm showing it, and it's it's very new. So, anyways, so how the one of the first thing we do when we study um, toxoplasma is do a plaque assay. Because remember, I told you that the parasite infect the cell, divide and lyses out, right? So we can actually use that to determine if there's any effect on growth or the lytic cycle, like we call it, when we remove a gene of interest. And so how do we do this? We take a monolayer of human foreskin fibroblast, so they're flat, we infect them with a certain number of parasites, we wait for seven to 10 days, depend on the depending on the parasite strain. And then we, without moving them, and then we wash off the parasite, we stain. And these holes indicate areas where one parasite infected on day zero. And then as the parasite divides, its daughter, its daughter does infect neighboring cells. And because you're not moving it, they just have to remain in a particular area. And so that is a plaque assay. So we use our mutants and um, um, Cynthia performed this black assay and without even looking at the, at the quantification, I hope you can appreciate that deletion of SR4 
really impairs the um, lytic cycle of the of the parasite. And so it's a significant difference, and we've obtained similar finding with the SR2 mutant. So this suggests to us that in the type 1 strain, in the type 1 parasites, um, these uh, SR proteins, so the SR genes, are important for the lytic cycle of the tachyzoid. And so now that we have these two, we are going to try to, uh, we are sending it to, um, uh, we are collecting, well, we actually did. So we infected the cell, we collected the RNA, and now we're sending it for RNA sequencing. And with our collaborators, we are going to analyze the RNA species that come out and to see which gene, uh, which gene are under the regulation of the SR4 or SR2 and see which one are differentially regulated that could be involved in the conversion to bradyzoite and back to tachyzoite. So this is where this story, um, this story sits. And the second part is done with Dr. Roy at, um, at uh, San Francisco State. And so I'm really, really excited about what we'll find. And what is also really interesting, and that is Roy's part, he's an evolutionary biologist, is using, is looking at um, non, what do you call it? Non-traditional um, splicing events. And I'm looking at what are the genes that are differentially spliced? And so that's, that's a pretty cool collaboration there. So I'm really excited about it. Um, I can pause here and maybe answer some question for this part, or I can continue. Uh, we, can, what do you we can do it either way you'd like to. Um, we, have, we do have a, a number of questions, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it up to you, which, whichever way you prefer yeah. to do it. Yeah, I think we can stop here for now, and okay. then I will answer those questions because we we switching gears a bit. Okay, three yes. times. That sounds good. All right. Okay. Um, so, if you're in the chat and you want to you want to ask questions about the stuff that's just been covered, you know, keep them coming. We'll we'll go through questions until there's no more. Um, so the first question here we have is: um, Does the tissue become necrotic, or is it programmed programmed cell death of host cells? Oh, so the um, so it's huh. Does the tissue become necrotic? In what case? So they don't die by apoptosis. So when toxoplasma, so toxoplasma can actually, so imagine that you have this cell over here is infected, right? Okay, mm -hmm. let's say this one is infected. Yeah. When toxoplasma comes out, it's lysis. It's, it's total um, necrosis, okay? Mm -hmm. But then toxoplasma, at least in trophoblast, it was shown that the parasite can be invading the cell and cause the next cell to undergo apoptosis, and in some case to prevent apoptosis. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so this question, the person that asked the question, said, uh, like the one that was in the eye. Yes. So that's. Um, so this will be. It, I guess it will be necrosis, but what you will see will be tissue cysts right there as well. Okay. So it's like damaged tissue, but you have cells that have the tissue cyst inside because the, the, the cyst is still intracellular. So you have to have cells that are also present that are alive there for the, for the parasite to survive. Okay, that makes sense. Um, let's see. Is there any part of the life cycle that's happening only in humans? No. So in, let me put it this way. So the human, human are inter, an intermediate host. So the part where you have sporozoite going to tachyzoite, going to bradyzoite, or bradyzoite going to, to, to tachyzoite, to bradyzoite, that happens in all the intermediate hosts. Now, the molecules that Toxo uses to do that may be different depending on the host. So in my old, um, in the lab, I did my, put, my, my postdoc in at St. Ford, the, there's a postdoc there who was actually looking at what surface proteins Toxo was using to infect chicken cells, cow cell versus human cell. And it turns out that they, they, there's a difference. So the parasite has different coats, if you will, depending on what type of organism it is infecting. And we don't know much about that at all. Okay. All right. That's interesting. Um, is there a way to kill the, the O-cysts if you suspect your cat is shedding? <laughs> uh, 
So the horses are really, 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 really difficult to kill. Um, okay. I, we, we keep it in, um, in um, sulfuric acid. Right for wow. years, it can be in sulfuric acid. So it is really, I mean, you have to like, you have to autoclave. It's really, really difficult to 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 to, to kill. Okay. So wow. I wouldn't. I would just, yeah. Yeah. Try to throw, try put to, the yeah. put the cat litter in the trash tight nicely, and then throw it in in biohazard. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, does the Brady zoite uh, cross the placental barrier? No. So. If you are, let's say um, I am chronically infected with toxoplasma right now and I become pregnant, I am unlikely to pass the parasite to my, to my child, mm -hmm. right? But, you know, it would be nice if my doctor can monitor me. Sure. But that is, is, is not likely. But if you, become preg if you become infected while you are pregnant, so you become infected de novo while you are pregnant, then you will eat, let's say, the bradyzoite, right? Yeah. But then the bradyzoite will turn into the tachyzoite, and the tachyzoite can go on and infect the fetus. So we only, at this point, from our knowledge, um, uh, tachyzoite are the only, the, the only known stage of the parasite that can cross the placental barrier. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, so... I need to get clarification on when this, I forget when this was, when this question was asked, um, can you induce this transition in vitro or do you have to infect the host, uh, not just Yes, wait for the second, for the third part. Okay, all right. I'll show you how we do it. All right, good. Uh, let's see, are the splice sites canonical, uh, canonical ones uh, similar to Drosophila? Ooh, that's, I, I cannot answer that question. Uh, honestly, because I haven't looked at them that seriously yet. Okay. Like I said, we just started the project, mm -hmm. and um, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not a big um, alternative splicing person yet, but okay. I'm learning, and that's a good question. I will make sure to check that. All right. Uh, so this this was a question I had, and I'm, uh, as a non biologist, uh, how do you design the experiment to remove the SR4 or SR2 specifically? Okay. So I'm going to go back to this slide. Okay, so you have um, you have a big piece of DNA, okay? Mm -hmm. And then we have now this system that we call CRISPR. And essentially uh, what CRISPR is, it has, um, can I annotate this? Okay, let's see. Let me try to do it. Okay. Okay. So here's your gene of interest, right? Mm -hmm. And then our CRISPR, CRISPR system, you have a molecule that is called a guide RNA mm -hmm. that we introduce into the parasite, right? So we take a normal parasite and we force it to have this guide RNA and an enzyme that we call Cas9. Now the guide RNA is specific to the gene that you are interested in. So it's going to go and then it's gonna bind to the area of interest. Mm -hmm. And then the enzyme, the Cas9 enzyme will come in and sit right at a particular site in that particular gene where the guide RNA has guided it. And then it's gonna cut it, okay? okay. So it's gonna cut that gene. And because that will be a DNA break. So when there's a DNA break, that's not good. So the, the cell, the, the cell, our cells, the parasite cells mm -hmm. have to repair that double strand break. And so we force it to take up our, our, um, our donor DNA, so called like our donor DNA, mm -hmm. which now has specific sites outside of this gene of interest. Okay? okay. So now this guy will match this guy, this guy will match this guy, and they're just gonna pop out and replace. So it's so now oh, okay. this will be gone. And this will replace that. And so the, the parasite doesn't care, right? Mm -hmm. well, at this point, I'm, I'm going to anthropogenize it a little bit. Okay. The parasite was in this state where, oh my God, I have a DNA break, right? I have a DNA break. I need to fix it. I need something to fix it. And then we're like, yeah, if you want to survive in this particular medium, you need to use this to fix that. And okay. then we force feed it uh, donor DNA and that's how it fixes it. And so that's how we can target it to um, specific genes. Okay, interesting. The, for, the, for the plaque assay, uh, do you use methyl cellulose overlay or agarose overlay? 
We don't use any overlay at all. We basically have, so we use, um, like I said, human foreskin fibroblasts. So they form this monolayer. Um, they are contact inhibited. So they bind to the bottom of the flask and then they just stay there. They nicely touch each other. So they look like a, like a sheet, mm -hmm. if you will. And then we put the parasite in and then we let the parasite do the thing without okay. moving them. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so if you were to remove, so you showed the, the SR, or you showed the SR4 data and, and how it led to at least a, le a lesser amount of infection. If you removed both, both SR2 and SR4 at the same time, would, would that lead to more, or sorry, would that lead to less infection or maybe even no infection? Or is there sort of like a, a limit to what you can achieve just doing that? So I would expect that if you knock, if you have a double knockout SR2, SR4, you will probably not have viable parasites. Okay. Um, because based on, so the SR2 data also looks like the SR4. So mm. both individually, they are, at, uh, they are unable to complete the, the lytic cycle properly. So I think, I mean, I guess I shouldn't put my finger in the fire for that because you can get <laughs> negative, negative gives you positive. Sure. But I, I would expect that we will not be able to create a double knockout that is that infects better than the than the wild type. Okay. Uh, but I don't know. But that's something that we 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 can we can definitely do and try to see. Okay. All right. Because what what is clear here though, what is clear is that. When you knock out SR4, mm -hmm. the other SRs don't seem to be uh, compensating for its absence, right? Yeah, absolutely. So they may be doing different things that may, um, so, so yeah, so you may get similar results, um, mm -hmm. assuming that these one that you see are SR2 mediated, then a double knockout will remove all the plaques. But if it is not, then it will be different, right? So, right. Yeah, but okay. I expect it won't be a good thing for the parasites. That would make sense, yeah. Uh, let's see, it looks like this, so this is the last one we have for right now. Um, is the idea behind the research basic, uh, learning how genes cause toxoplasma to behave, or is it applied trying to use the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, gene ma manipulation for treatment? Um, no, so my lab is a basic, um, basic science lab. Uh, I just really want to understand the biology of the parasite. And so we use the CRISPR system because it has been adapted for toxoplasma and it's faster to generate mutants using that system versus what we were doing the old way. So back in the day, you can take, it can take you a year to get a parasite, uh, a, a gene knockout in toxoplasma. Like, months and months and now we can get a mutant in like three weeks so it's a little bit faster <laughs> it's much 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 faster although my students are taking forever <laughs> <laughs> but you know they're undergrad they're learning so yeah, yeah but yeah. It's, it's that's that's why we're using the, the CRISPR system and i am i am a, a molecular microbiologist and mm. I like to understand um, how microbes cause disease. Mm -hmm. And that really is what, what is driving my work. Um, the hope is that if we identify these type of factors, like uh, SRs or whatever, that could be used as drug targets, right? Potential drug targets um, um, against toxoplasma. But that's something that somebody else can do. <laughs> All right. Very cool. Yeah. Um, so... I can keep going. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So now we talked a little bit about some of the work we're doing on understanding regulation of differentiation. Now I want to talk about metabolism, right? So how does toxoplasma adjust from one metabolic state to another? So I've been talking about bradyzoite, tachyzoite, slow, fast, and so on. So here's what they look like. So this is the tachyzoite. And this is a bradyzoite. Without me even saying anything, you can already see that you have these white things, these white um, structures that are popping and that are pretty much absent here. So these structure, these structure are starch granules. And in, in the starch that are in these granules is called amylopectin. So amylopectin, we eat amylopectin in potatoes. 
in, um, in wheat and, and so on. So amylopectin is a branched polymer of glucose. And um, it is thought that the parasite uses it as a source of energy during chronic infection. Okay. So you have tachyzoite. They are dividing in the host cell involved in acute infection. And then the immune system kicks in. And then all of a sudden you have this accumulation of this amylopectin in the bradyzoite. So how the triggers for how amylopectin gets uh, stored, when and how it gets used, uh, what are the signals, all of that we don't understand. But what we know is that toxoplasma has all the pathway, I mean, all the enzyme required for the production of amylopectin, as well as the catabolism, so the breaking down of amylopectin. And so the parasite energy source is mainly glycolysis, at least as tachyzoid, glycolysis is really important. And so one of the, one, uh, one of the idea is that during stage conversion, the parasite will uh, shunt some of the, six, the, the glucose 6-phosphate into the amylopectin um, uh, production pathway. And then when it needs, um, when it needs energy, it will basically break down amylopectin to one um, to glucose one phosphate, which will get converted to glucose six phosphate, and then get down to complete the glycolysis process. Right. So just this is just a study that was done by um, Sugi et al. Uh, not too long ago. I mean, 2017. And what they did is they knocked out or they they made a mutation in the catalytic site of the uh, glycogen phosphorylase here. This gene is the last enzyme required to produce um, glucose 1-phosphate one, one when you break down amylopectin. And what they found is that amylopectin, as expected, accumulates in the tissue cyst, but also accumulates in the tachyzoite vacuole, right? And uh, the parasite don't look very happy. And so it is clear that Proper, um, proper usage and proper breakdown of amylopectin is important for, cyst, uh, for proper cyst formation, okay? So what my question, like I said, is we know that amylopectin is important for cystogenesis, but then those bradyzoites have this amylopectin. How... how <laughs> It gets used so fast that the question is, what's the regulation behind that, right? And so this is my team metabolism here. These three, they graduated. So Emily is now a, a teacher. Uh, she's a tenure track lecturer at um, Laney College here in California. And these two are research assistants in different labs around the country. So um, Daniel, Daniel's at Stanford and um, um, uh, Janak is on the East Coast. And then currently Idris is a master student driving this project with my cloning uh, stars, Honey and Sahana. They're just two high school students, but amazing, amazing students. Um, they are cloning mistresses, it's just amazing. Anyway, so what we've been doing, again, we look at the genomic, um, the, the transcriptomic profile of toxoplasma comparing the bradyzoite to the tachyzoite. And we found that there's 422 genes that are upregulated in the bradyzoite compared to the tachyzoite. And of those genes, 48 of them were annotated. So we're just looking at those that are annotated. So they have a prediction associated with them. So 48 of them are associated with metabolic enzyme and 21 are specifically involved or associated with uh, starch metabolism. So glucose, maltose, uh, sucrose, and so on. So these were interesting. Another thing that I wanted to point out is that toxoplasma has many glycolytic enzymes. And what is interesting is that some of them are isozymes, right? Meaning that they two copies of the same enzyme, essentially. But if you look at this NO1 and NO2, so these are enolase 1 and enolase 2, you can see that the parasite differentially regulate these enzymes as well. So NO1 is highly expressed in the bradyzoite, right, during chronic infection compared to the NO2. 
but NU2 is upregulated during acute infection even though the enzymes are doing the same thing, which is at the end, uh, in, 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 at the end in the, uh, after glycolysis. So they do the same thing with lactate dehydrogenase and so on and so forth. And so what my graduate student was interested in, Emily, she wanted to look at these two genes over here, GPM1 and GPM2. They are isozyme, but they don't follow the pattern, right? Both of them are upregulated in the chronic infection and what do they do? So PGM1 and PGM2 or GPM1, GPM2, depending on who you talk to. In Toxo, we call them PGM1. So these are phosphoglucomutases or glucophosphate mutases. And what they do, they sit at the corner between glycolysis and amylopectin and amylopectin biosynthesis and gluconeogenesis, right? So these enzyme, they, they convert, they, they catalyze the interconversion of glucose 6-phosphate to glucose 1-phosphate, okay? And so they are upregulated in the chronic phase. And so Emily uh, focused her work on this PGM1. And so, of course, the same thing we did. We knocked out PGM1 and we asked whether or not the parasite accumulates amylopectin in vitro. And uh, as you can see, I mean, we didn't quantify it. And when Emily showed me this data, I think I cried a little bit. But uh, anyways, so you can see here that the, um, um, okay, let me, let me back up a little bit. So we infected our, um, our monolayer with the with the parasite, and then we force them to switch to tachyzoite to to bradyzoite to form tissue cysts in vitro, and we stain the cyst wall with dolichos B fluorous agglutinin, and we stain the um, the sugar amylopectin with periodic acid shift, and these here are the host nucleus, and then the little tiny dot are the parasite nucleus, and so as you can see, deletion of GPM one doesn't seem to have an effect on uh, amylopectin accumulation. But this is qualitative. We haven't quantified it for reason that I don't want to go into. We lost the strain, we're remaking the strain now, um, but I can answer that later. Uh, so anyway, so that's what we have. And we also looked at plaque assay under glucose rich condition, and we didn't see significant difference between the wild type and the mutant, tachyzoid. So then we looked at the cyst size, right? So when we uh, knocked out the PGM1, on average, what we found is that the cyst seems to be smaller, have a smaller area than the wild type. And this is just four day post, um, post uh, switch induction. And so, I mean, it's not that strong of a phenotype, but there is a phenotype. So whether or not, PGM2 is compensating for the absence of PGM1 is something that we are investigating. But this phenotype is not unheard of because uh, previous study knocking out hexokinase, which is the first enzyme in the, um, in the glycolysis pathway, right? Taking glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. When they knock out this gene, they also found that the cyst is pretty small. So together, this tells us that uh, uh, PGM1 and other um, glycolytic enzymes are important for the optimal production of, of tissue cysts. And so, you know, we have more studies to do on, on, on this pathway, but they are, we are knocking out those 21 genes to basically try to answer um, answer this question and eventually go and look at how those genes are regulated themselves. So I'm going to stop here and see if you have any question about this part. Absolutely, right into it. Uh, can you try using 1,6-glycosidases uh, glyco try this one. Glycosidases to inhibit these bugs? Huh, interesting. Um, yeah. Um, that's interesting. We haven't tried it yet. One of the things that we want to do, because all the experiments that I showed you were in presence of glucose, one of the things we want to do is 
do the experiment in the absence of glucose and then start going, um, start going at, you know, mechanism. Um, but that's, that's definitely a good idea. Idris, I hope you're writing this down because I know you're there. <laughs> I know you're there. There you go. <laughs> Uh, how well do these bugs sur uh, survive anaerobic conditions? How do they survive anaerobic condition? Or, um, or how well do they survive? They do survive. So um, uh, Takizoi do aerobic metabolism, but they, yeah, they survive pretty well because they do. Um, they don't necessarily. Uh, the TCA is not active, um, so they get the nutrient from. Um, they can get the energy from glycolysis, like I said, which is anaerobic, right? And then mm -hmm. they can also get it from gluconeogenesis via glutaminolysis. Uh, so they use glutamine as well. So there's a whole like carbon, glutamine and glucose sort of helping with the central carbon um, metab metabolism of this parasite. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how do you quantify the change? So you, so you, you, you were just talking about quantifying um the change of the the uh, i guess the um, um, amylo amylopectin the, yeah how, yeah how so would you do that? especially like in this so, case where it's very high yeah so um at this point uh the way we're thinking about doing it was to look at um to basically do fluorescence um um well what's what's called that uh, pixel like sort of quantify the the fluorescence but i don't think that's the best that's the best way. So that's why I was thinking if it's not a very clear, clear, um, clear phenotype, mm -hmm. maybe we'll have to think about something else as proxy um, for, for quantification. Okay. But yeah, so initially we were going to do MFI. Okay. That's what I'm looking for. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, so the last question we have is, is basically asking uh, what ha what happens if you change the type of sugar so if you like maltodextrin instead of glucose that's a good point and um, that's one of the things so the rest of this project we're working with um Dr. Martor Martorelli Bruno in Vermont um mm -hmm. we just started the collaboration and he does have that sugar and so we're making a knockout in all those 21 genes and mm -hmm. one of the essay that would be done would be to grow them with glucose and with a uh, a glucose analog that is not glucose essentially yeah okay. so that is in the pipeline okay very cool yeah uh, and, okay i'm uh, oh, sorry what real quick uh the rama who's one of those asking about like the, the the one who's asking all the really good questions uh suggests isolating and doing mass spec on the, for the on the on the immunopectin mm -hmm. yeah yeah yeah, you can tell I'm not a biochemist. So I'm like, huh, let's see. Who am I going to get to do this for me? <laughs> because I was thinking reporter genes, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm thinking. Okay, so right. let's get to this last bit. I promise it's, it's, this one is kind of short, I think. Okay, so we've been talking about toxoplasma is a parasite that is nasty, but it belongs to a phylum that is called epicomplexa. And this phylum, they, all the parasites in this phylum are, veter are pathogenic, okay? So they infect animals or they infect humans or both. I mean, humans are animals, but you guys get what I mean. So this phylum include Plasmodium falciparum, uh, which is the causative agent of malaria, which is killing um, uh, a child every two minutes uh, in the world. And so you have, so Plasmodium is... Yes, it infects humans, but you also have plasmodium that infects birds. Babesia is for cow. Sarcosystis, I always forget which one this one is for, but isospora is for pig, Imeria chicken, Lancastrella frog. So you can say any organism seems to have its own epicomplexa that does its thing. But some of these, uh, some of these, like Babesia, for instance, can infect human isosporas, and you also have neospora. So Toxoplasma is used also as a model organism to study the biology of these epicomplexa. And they are called epicomplexa not because they have epicoplast, because not all of them have epicoplast, but because they have this epical side 
that we call the epical complex, okay? And so why do we care about it? So the epical complex is important because it contains, it harbors uh, organelles that are only found in the epicomplex act, okay? So these organelles include the micronemes, so those little straight lines over here, they're called micronemes. They also have the dense granules, and you have those club-shaped organelles that are called the rope trees. So different epicomplexa have different numbers of rope trees. Um, toxoplasma has about four to six. Plasmodium has two, and I think cryptosporidium has one. But we care about these organelles, which we call specialized secretary organelles, because their content is, uh, their content are, ex are secreted out of the parasite to allow parasite motility, parasite attachment to whole cells, parasite invasion into the whole cell, forming this parasitophorous vacuole, and modulating the host immune response. And so I'm just going to show you a couple of examples here. So this is toxoplasma, which is squeezing itself inside the host cell. And this is the host cell, and this is the host nucleus. And you can see the protrusion of the conoid over here. And then this rope tree, the content of these rope trees have been discharged directly into the host cell, into the host cytosol. Some of these um, protein will find their way into the host nucleus and take over the, uh, transcription, the, the transcription machinery of the, of the whole cell, for instance. Now the parasite will divide inside this parasitophorous vacuole by a process that we call um, endodiogeny. And as it divides and form this establishes itself in the whole cell, it will recruit host membrane to the parasitophorous vacuole, I mean, host organelles to the parasitophorous vacuole membrane. So here you're looking at, this is the host mitochondrion, mitochondria, so this is one mitochondrion, another one, that the parasite brings to this vacuole to do what? We don't know, but that happens. It also recruits microtubules, it recruits uh, the ER, the Golgi, and it just stays in there and does its thing, lyses out and leaves. And so, you can, you can think about toxoplasma interaction with the host cell as an uninvited person comes into your house, takes over your house, rearranges everything, and then when they leave, you are dead and your house is trash, essentially. That's toxoplasma for you. And we know a lot about the molecules that are involved in, this, uh, in these processes by studying the tachyzoite, right? But what excites me is that the sporozoite and the bradyzoite also have these specialized organelles. And you guessed it, we don't know much about them. We only know two, um, we only know of two rope tree proteins in the bradyzoite, and one of them doesn't seem to be, in, to be uh, required for virulence in mice. And then the other one, uh, is important for um, uh, proper um, cyst formation. But this is when you start with um, oral infection and acute infection. So my question is, toxoplasma, what are the proteins that are sporozoite specific or bradyzoite specific that are involved in this process of host pathogen interaction? So for, let me back up here. For a long time, we used to think that when you get infected with the sporozoite, the sporozoite are non-immunogenic because the surface protein has been shown to be non-immunogenic. So we wanted to know if that were true because we wanted to know whether or not there's even some changes that happen in the whole cell when we do infection with bradyzoite, with, with, with sporozoite. And so we did this work. Uh, I did this work when I was at Stanford in collaboration with um, Heather, um, um, Heather Fritz when she was at Washington State, and now she's, at, um, she's back at UC Davis. But anyway, so what we did, we took toxoplasma tachyzoite, we infected mice, we waited for the mice to be chronically infected, so for 30 days. After that, we isolated the brain of the mice, then we isolated the, the, the tissue cysts from the mouse brain, and we fed it to kittens and we allowed the kitten to become infected and to shed the oocyst. 
We collected cat poop, isolated the oocysts, stored them in sulfuric acid to allow them to sporulate, and then broke them open via a very complicated multi-step process to get our sporozoite. And when we got the sporozoite, we took them and we infected rat intestinal epithelial cells and asked the question, is there any, what are the transcriptional changes that occurs when sporozoite infect enterocyte versus when cachyzoite infect enterocyte? And we did it by looking at the transcriptomic profile by RNA sequencing. And so what we found, <laughs> I can tell you that I cried. Okay, so what we found looking at about 15,000 genes in the rat, right? 26, only 26 genes were differentially expressed that had higher, um, that were differentially expressed in sporozoite infected cells compared to uninfected cells, okay? And for two days, I didn't go to the lab when I got this data. I didn't go to the lab, I didn't want to look at it. I cried a lot. And then eventually I got over myself and looked at those genes. And what was really cool is that the majority of these genes, are associated with the immune response, right? So they basically cause, they're associated with the inflammatory response. So this suggests that the infection with sporozoite induces an immune response. And we know that this immune response is the one that basically gets amplified during the tachyzoite stage. And so this is the model that we had. You infect with sporozoite, you start the immune response, but then the sporozoite switches quickly to the tachyzoite, which can, if you will, take on that immune response and, and, and escape it. So whether or not the immune response that is induced is the host cell trying to get rid of the parasite, or it is the parasite inducing that immune response to get the signal that they are in the host, so they have to switch, is something that is unclear and something that we're interested in answering. Because we know that toxoplasma really has a yin-yang interaction with the host immune response. Because when you think about it, the parasite, the tachyzoite needs to become a bradyzoite so that it can get back into the cat. So there is an evolutionary benefit for the parasite to induce that immune response. And we, don't, we still don't understand how that is, is, is sort of modulated. Okay. So then we looked at the parasite themselves. So we looked at um, the transcriptome of sporozoite that are infecting the cell and then the, the transcriptome of the tachyzoite and we compared the two. And so we found about 743 genes that had high expression in the sporozoite compared to the tachyzoite. And many of these genes were annotated, but you can see that there's a large number. So about over 300 genes that there's nothing known about them. They were hypothetical. And I was excited about it because I was about to go start my lab. And when I saw that, I was like, go pop. So I looked at those genes and 85 of them were predicted to have signal peptide. Okay. And so one of these genes, when I actually did this study, one of these genes was GRAT28. At the time, it was hypothetical. And then they showed that that GRAT28 actually in the tachyzoite help modulate uh, CCL, CCL2, I think, CCL2 or CCL22, so some, some chemokine. So just to say that there's definitely, it definitely is a bold mine and there's a lot of things to, to understand here. Then I also looked at uh, previous studies that was done by, by Heather, and my rationale was that sporozoite and bradyzoite, they both are insisted, they both initiate infection in the gut, right? And so they both probably share a subset of genes that are highly expressed, that are not, that are not, uh, that are highly expressed only in, in them, if you will, at these stages. So let me, let me, let me say that again. So the hypothesis is that sporozoite and bradyzoite have genes that are highly expressed in the two form compared to the tachyzoite because the two forms are involved in initiating infection in a new host. So when I looked, when I used uh, Heather studies, I identified 48 genes that are, um, that are predicted to have a signal peptide. And that's the closest 
I could get to gene that could end up into these secretory organelles because we don't know how proteins get into the rope trees. We don't know how they get into the micronemes. We don't, well, we know a little bit about the microneme, but we don't know how they get into the dense granules. And so this is the closest. So again, the hypothesis is that some of these genes will encode proteins that are targeted to these organelles and eventually find their way into the host cell during uh, invasion by bradyzoite or sporozoite. So at CSU East Bay, I cannot work with sporozoite. We do not have CAT. And also the CAT that we use in the study, um, at, uh, in the study that I just showed you, the transcriptional study, these CAT were adopted, so they're just fine. Um, at least when we were done with them, they were fine. So um, even though we cannot do, we cannot get OSIS over there, that's fine. We focus our study on the bradyzoite so we can get the bradyzoite from animal uh, in, at East Bay. But also, like you noticed already, we can induce the tachyzoite to become bradyzoite in vitro. And the way we do it, we infect the monolayer with the tachyzoite, but we starve the parasite. So we remove... Um, we do not supplement with uh, carbon dioxide anymore. We have an alkaline pH and then low nutrients. So instead of 10% FBS, we give 1% uh, FBS. And eventually the parasite gets stressed out and form the cyst. And we can take these cysts, we can open them up and then use the parasite to infect intestinal cells and see that they can uh, switch back. And so this is, a, a, this is a system that we have in the lab that we can we can e exploit. And so this is team virulence. Each of them have their gene. Um, Paula uh, started one of the projects and she's now a graduate student. She's doing her PhD in neuroscience at UC Davis. She's really is my baby. I'm really so proud of her. She was one of my first undergrad. But anyway, so how are we going to do this? We are essentially going to be using reverse genetics. And the idea is, yes, we have our wild type. We can get our bradyzoite in vitro. We can also get them in vivo. But we're going to take the tachyzoite, identify those gene of interest, knock them out, do a switch assay. And so this, this direction will allow us to identify novel differentiation factors. If the gene is able, if deletion the gene doesn't affect this um, process of conversion, we can then isolate the mutant and then perform uh, functional assays in intestinal epithelial cells, but also do oral infection in, in animal. But I'm not going to tell you any, I'm not going to give you any data with, um, with bradyzoite mutant. I know. <laughs> I'm not going to give you any data with bradyzoite mutant tonight because we wanted to make sure that the genes that we were looking at do not have an effect on the acute infection as tachyzoite, because that may confound our initiation of infection um, area that we, that we are studying. So the data that I have now is just to show you uh, a basic screening that we've, that we've done using the tachyzoite, the regular fast replicating um, form. So anyway, so we knocked out um, several genes, so 13 of them. And here's just an example of a plaque assay. So this is the wild type, and this is the dense granule, um, nine protein. And you can see that the parasite is, uh, they form the mutant form lower, smaller number of plaque and oh, smaller size plaque and smaller number of plaques. And so we did it for several of them. And then we used these uh, mutants to infect uh, mice, looking specifically at the acute phase of infection and the ability of the mutant to produce bradyzoite. And what we found when you look at person survival over time, over about 25 days, the wild type, which is in red over here, most of the animal eventually die. And some of the um, some of the mutants, when you compile all the experiment, uh, some die faster than the wild type. But then we found uh, four that are avirulent, right? So they basically become attenuated. And this uh, grand nine, we got scooped on that, which is fine because we have more data. 
about this, uh, why we think it is a virulent. It's probably because you cannot prevent um, phagocytosis by macrophages, but that's preliminary. Um, so there's a paper that confirmed all of our findings here. And then uh, this one, 243930, is now called TG gamma, and it was shown to be involved in, um, in invasion of the parasite. And so now we are rushing to try to get the story for these two genes out, the row 23 and the 287040. And so to summarize this, uh, we had nine genes that didn't show any significant defect in the lytic cycle, which is good because it means that the tachyzoite are fine. And uh, three of them are impaired as tachyzoite, um, and one of them produce, grows faster than the, than the wild type. And then the four that became attenuated in, vi in vivo that I just showed you. But really what, <coughs> what I'm excited about are these nine that um, don't seem to be attenuated as tachyzoite, so now we can <coughs> we can get the bradyzoite of these uh, mutants and perform oral infection to see whether or not they can initiate the infection and get all the way back to bradyzoite. So the effect, the the defect that we expect will be uh, very early in in infection because we know acute and chronic seem to be okay. So now it's can they can they do what bradyzoite actually do? Anyway, so. I think I'm going to leave it at that. So this is um, where we are. So using this reverse genetics, we can identify novel virulence determinants. And we have a lot of work to do, a lot of genes to play with. Um, I call my lab one gene, one student. And so it's a new lab and we, we just getting started, I guess. Um, so I like to thank my lab member, the current one, and then these are all the former students who contributed in one or another way to, to these stories. And then collaborators who brought, who gave us some, um, some reagents and then funding. I need some funding to write some grants. <laughs> and thank you so much for staying up and listening. I really appreciate it. And I'll take any more questions. Absolutely. It's a fantastic talk. I am now but very interested and thoroughly terrified about the <laughs> <laughs> You wanted to know. <laughs> yeah, you know what? Now I do it. Now I regret that, but <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that, this is a fantastic talk. Super interesting, very entertaining, very informative. I, I learned Thank a ton. Uh, so let's go. We, have, we do have a few more questions. And if anybody wants to get any in at the last minute, absolutely go ahead and ask them now. Um, so the first one is, can you, can you give sort of a, a general overview? You said there were a lot of things, you know, like with the host cell interaction, the mechanism of the, you know, of certain parts of the infection, the cycle or whatever that you don't know about. Can you give just a general overview of, of how you can learn more about it, maybe beyond, you know, the things that you're looking at right now? Are there just, just, uh, you know, I know, I know, it's, I know it's a kind of a broad question, but just generally speaking, like how, how do you start to investigate those? Um, I think I'm a bit confused about the question. Like, how do I, how do I develop the qu a question? Well, so, so you said there, there are a number of things that you said, you know, like, like this, this thing happens. Oh, really a number of things that we don't yeah. know. Yeah. I so see, like, I like see, how do you start to dig into that? You know, again, just, just very generally. <laughs> okay. So, um, so the way I think about things <laughs> mm -hmm. is that they are the big labs right yeah. so now we have this technique called um, single cell transcriptomic profiling so they're looking at individual parasites and look at gene expression in there mm -hmm. you have others would do um you know you have basically those big study that look at genome wide type thing right okay. and so for instance the the trafficking the how proteins are trafficked to the road trees um, one of the things that we're doing in, in the lab, which I didn't talk about, is looking at the role of the, of the time of expression. Mm -hmm. So in this case, we're, doing, um, we're using promoter swapping um, uh, approach. So a lot of the things that I do, like I said, I, I'm a molecular microbiologist, so I do genetics mm -hmm. mostly, so molecular microbiology techniques. So, I, um, I, so in this case, to understand 
the timing, how protein gets to where they need to go. We know that some of those protein are loaded only at particular time mm -hmm. during the development of the parasites during cell division. And so looking at promoters that are active during these stages will help us, right? So yeah. we're doing that and hopefully I'm going to sit down and write a paper and it's going to come out at the end of the spring semester. Perfect. But it's, uh, so that's one way to do it. Another way um, is, like I said, um, for instance, they use this, um, the Ross Waller's lab use this uh, hyperlopid method to try to map out all the gene, all the proteins in toxoplasma trying to predict where they are localized. Mm -hmm. And so we can use that and say, okay, of all these genes that are in the, that are predicted to be in the rope trees, which one are differentially expressed? And then mm -hmm. we can go after them and study them. So I'm more of a reductionist, you know, like one gene at a time type thing, but sure. you have others who look at it. Uh, they do system biology and look at it at the, bigger scale okay. i don't know if that answered the question no yeah, but, that, that did yeah. that did that's, that's a good explanation yeah. for it uh so let's see have you looked at lipid transport proteins that are responsible for membrane formation um their expression may be different in these various forms i think that no have, yeah go ahead no we haven't looked at transport protein um yet okay no uh, so to, again, as me as a non-biologist, can you talk, what's the threshold for a gene being considered differentially expressed? <laughs> Why well, must you ask that? <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I like to cause trouble. What can I say? I know. So trust me, I, uh, I just, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, so there are statistical, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? A uh, method out there. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we take. So imagine you have two samples, right? And then you look at all the RNA molecules that you got from all of these, from sample one, you look at all the one you got from sample two, okay. and then you map them up, you map them back to the genome to see which genes are present, like which, which mRNA comes from which gene. Mm -hmm. And then you calculate the, you, you calculate, if you will, the ratio of each of the gene relative to the total number of, of, of reads that you've gotten, right? Okay. And then you do um, you use a different statistical method to decide which change is statistically significant. Mm -hmm. And then um, personally, I set, a, you can set an arbitrary threshold. So you can say, okay, I'm going to just care about genes that are statistically significantly differentially expressed that mm -hmm. have twofold and high oh, twofold okay. higher yeah. so that's that's how it's that's how i do it and i think okay. that's how people do it in general but there are statistical um methods that i applied to it okay all right that, that makes sense i've done similar things with like signal to noise ratios and stuff like that yeah so the good news is i'm not a biostatistician <laughs> so we just there's like um uh what's it what are they called? They called. Uh, so when I did the other study, we used the Kyogen, um, the Kyogen platform to go through, um, to go through the analysis. And then um, what's the other one? Illumina has it too, and that Toxo also has. They have the tools to actually analyze your RNA sequencing data. Oh, okay. And so the statistic is kind of all built in there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That that's nice. <laughs> that's, I know. That's very I know. Nice. Yeah. Okay, awesome. I think that's all the questions we've got. So if any, if anybody wants to get them in, again, please feel free to do so. I'll I'll start slowly wrapping up. So you got a minute if you want to. Um, but thank you to uh, again, Dr. Keaton, for a fantastic talk. Uh, thank you. Uh, like I said, super entertaining, very informative, uh, really wonderful. Uh, thank you to everybody for coming out. Yeah. Uh, Fantastic, great audience. Thank Lots you. of good questions. Um, yeah, for sure. Plenty and then plenty of good ideas. Thank you so yeah. much. Really appreciate it. Good. That's that's what that's what we're going for, is just good interaction. Yeah. Um, so I think that's all the questions we got. So I'll say a final thank you to everybody for coming out. Again, Dr. Keaton for a fantastic talk. Um, if I can you. hang around for just one second, we'll talk for just a, just real quick. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, again, thank you to everybody for coming out.
be we'll be back uh next week uh, we have another fantastic talk so i hope you'll uh come back out um have a great rest of your weekend stay safe stay dry warm depending on where you are uh and uh hopefully we'll see you next week yeah. thank you have a good night everybody Bye.